Four disability campaigners are asking the government for national guidance about how doctors should decide who gets critical care if we ever get to a point, and we're not there now, where demand for life-saving ventilators or beds outstrips supply. Their legal team will be making an urgent application for a judicial review today if the government decides that a national framework is not needed, as Charlotte Hayward reports. Doug Pawley, like the rest of us, is isolating in his home in West Yorkshire. He's passing the time driving a train on a simulator. Doug uses a wheelchair, has a history of stroke and mental health problems. If there's too much demand for critical care in the coming weeks, Doug's worried that he and other disabled people won't be prioritised. That's why he wants national guidance produced for doctors to help them make their decisions. My biggest fear is that without this guidance, some doctors and hospitals may decide that disabled people may require more treatment than they are prepared to give because they could treat multiple other people. But it also means that disabled people will be first against the wall. I am concerned that if there is a competition for critical care, that disabled people will be left out and will be left to die. Professor Catherine Runswick cole agrees. She's the mother of 24-year-old William, who loves playing the drums. William has a diagnosis of autism and a learning disability. Catherine would be very worried about how he would be treated if he became ill and went into hospital. He would be very distressed and his behaviour would be judged to be very challenging, I think. So we need a plan that's absolutely committed to upholding the rights of disabled people as set out in the UN Convention. Anne-Marie Irwin is from the law firm Rook Irwin Sweeney. She's representing both William and Doug and two others. At the moment, they don't know how doctors are going to be taking those resource decisions. So we're not talking about clinical decisions here. We're talking about the next stage when resources are limited and decisions have to be made about how to allocate those resources. They would like to know the basis on which doctors will be making those decisions and that it will be consistent across the country. This guidance would be for everyone, but it's campaigners like Catherine who fear that the vulnerable will be the first to be affected. I don't think that it's an unreasonable thing to be frightened when you know that the lives of people with learning disabilities are not fully valued in day-to-day -day life and this pandemic just makes that even more frightening. Last year's Learning Disability Mortality Review found that Down syndrome, or learning disabilities, had been the rationale in 19 different cases for a do not resuscitate order. We're making crystal clear that it is unacceptable for advanced care plans, including do not attempt to resuscitate orders, to be applied in a blanket fashion to any group of people. Last week, the Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock, made it clear that blanket policies were inappropriate. And the guidance from NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, says the clinical frailty scale, which is used by doctors to assess how fit a patient is, isn't appropriate for those with stable long-term disabilities, like cerebral palsy, for example, or autism or learning disabilities. But what about guidance if there aren't enough ventilators? At the moment, we're not in that situation. There is no shortage. But it has happened in other parts of the world. Both doctors and patients surely need some kind of national joined-up guidance. Dr Julian Sheather is a special advisor in ethics and human rights to the British Medical Association. It is essential that doctors feel confident that they are making the best possible decisions in the circumstances, that their decisions are ethical and lawful, and patients need the confidence that doctors are, are able to do that. And if that rests on coherent national guidance, I think it will give enormous confidence to the process. This pandemic is affecting all of our lives. Catherine Runswick Cole hopes it'll change how we view those with a disability. Of all the thinking that we do, as things change as we come out of this pandemic, we need to put disabled people and their families at the heart of the decision making that will follow. Get some news in brief now. A pair of disabled campaigners from our region are taking legal action to force the government to make it clear they have the same right to life sustaining treatments as non disabled people if they contract coronavirus. In the event the number of patients needing help outstrips supply, they fear they'll be fighting for their lives. Charlotte Leeming has this story. 
Disabled campaigner Doug Pawley from Weatherby is used to a legal battle. Three years ago, he won a landmark case to improve public transport for wheelchair users, and now he's taken on a new fight, which he says is a matter of life and death. Doug wants the government to publish national guidance for doctors on how to decide who receives life-saving treatment during the coronavirus pandemic if demand outstrips supply. The government hasn't set out how it will deal with, uh, how any church should deal with conflict if there's too many people for the resources. And the question is, who gets the critical care beds and who doesn't? Incredibly difficult situation to put doctors in, but it may well mean that people with pre-existing conditions and disabled people may not get the critical care they need and therefore may end up being left to die. Doug isn't alone in his legal campaign. 17-year-old Francesca Adam-Smith has complex medical needs and disabilities. Her mother Rachel says that without clear guidelines from the Department of Health, Francesca could be sidelined if she needed treatment for COVID-19. Doug and Rachel's solicitor has written to the government saying their failure to provide guidance is a breach of human rights. What we're looking at is where um, doctors have already decided that a patient can benefit from treatment, but we get to the next stage where actually there aren't enough ventilators to treat those patients. And so that's where we say the gap in guidance is. It's our client's fear that because of their disabilities, they may uh, go to the back of the queue, as it were, um, and be deprioritized for treatment. The Department of Health says it can't comment on pending legal action, but Doug says he won't rest until he gets definitive national guidance. He says that would reassure him that his life is valued as much as others. Charlotte Lee Ming, BBC Look North. Well, now there are many other issues surrounding disability in the current crisis, not the least of which are concerns over how hospitals might approach treatment. Disability campaigners are worried that they might not get the proper level of care, so they want the guidelines to be looked at by the courts. Earlier, I spoke to Doug Pawley and Catherine Runswick-Cole, who are both involved in that judicial review, which is due to be launched tomorrow. Doug is disabled and lives in a care home, and Catherine's son, William, has a diagnosis of hearing disability and autism. I began by asking Catherine about her concerns on official guidelines regarding medical treatment of the disabled during the COVID-19 outbreak. It's all unknown. We don't know how decisions would be made about how resources are allocated. But um, I do know as the parent of a young person with a learning disability in autism that in the past people have been discriminated against. We've had examples of do not resuscitate notices being given to people with learning disabilities in autism. So I'm very anxious about what might happen to him if he were admitted to hospital. And Doug, do you feel that you have exactly the same access to treatment, particularly if you get the, the disease, um, that anybody else would have in the health service? I have great concerns about it. You know, and in the absence of government framework for decision making, doctors on the front line have got this unenviable job of trying to work out who gets the treatment if there's too much competition for it. And I worry that disabled people like me and other people will end up not getting the care that they need and deserve and that other people would expect simply because we've got, you know, existing conditions. Well, that, that must be a widely held worry, amongst, particularly amongst people with disabilities. And I'm wondering, Catherine, this is obviously a hypothetical question, but in the event that your son did, alas, get the disease, is it guaranteed that you would go to hospital with him to ensure that any communications and rest of it were clear? Um, I think the guidance has changed on that, and I think it might be possible for me to go to hospital with him, but I'm not absolutely sure whether I would be able to. So I've tried to prepare for that situation. So I have a one-page profile which tells people a little bit about how they could communicate with William um, and the sorts of things that he would need extra help with in hospital. Catherine, what do you hope to get out of the case? Well, I really hope that the Secretary of State will produce guidance and that that guidance is produced in consultation with disabled people and their families and that it reflects the commitment to um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And I also hope that this conversation where we've begun to talk about human value in very open ways 
And those discussions were kind of going on behind closed doors. And as we move on in time, we start to move away from this pandemic. I think we need to think about the value of, of human life and the value of those that we marginalise and to try and change some of the health and social inequalities that were there before this pandemic, but that the pandemic has shone a light on, if you like. I can see, Doug, that you're absolutely in unison with that. But let me ask you this. I mean, we haven't had the opportunity very often to actually speak to people who are in care homes. And there's great concerns about care home care, if you like. Um, yes. What's your sense of that? Um, it is a uniquely vulnerable position to be reliant on people and PPE and services um, that you have no control over. I mean, the people, disabled people in the community will have similar concerns, I know, but, you know, I rely on people coming in on the bus from Leeds every day to come and get me up, help me to the toilet, all the things that a lot of other people can do for themselves. It's quite um, disconcerting and worrying. Do we have a sufficient PPE because a member of management in the home um, very presently and sensibly ordered a huge amount to um, put upstairs ready for if it was needed at the beginning of the crisis. There's been a major problem with access to testing. We have had symptomatic residents here who may have had coronavirus, um, which is obviously very concerning and um, puts people on edge and very stressful, but the home hasn't been able to access testing for those individuals. Catherine, what's your concern in terms of where your son lives now? Usually have the support of support workers. So William would usually be volunteering with the National Trust and going out with support workers, but we made the decision about four or five weeks ago that we wouldn't have support workers in the home anymore, so we're supporting him ourselves. And we're working very, very hard to shield him, but also try and keep some of his routines the same, um, ensure that he can do the things that he loves, like going for a walk and gardening and so on. So all of that's quite difficult for us too. Does he understand what's happening? He sort of does understand what's happening, sort of understands. Um, it's quite difficult because he likes to go over and over to try and, and understand things better. And he's really angry about the virus, as, as lots of people are. He's really angry about some of the things that he can't do. Well, thank you both, Catherine and Doug, very, very much for your different but quite similar concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.